Welcome everyone, my name is Jonathan Lipp, the founder and director of the Big Apple Film Festival, and welcome to the Big Apple Film Festival podcast. I am here today with our guest, animator Bill Plimpton. Yes. Bill has had an incredible, illustrious career. He has uh, been nominated for two Academy Awards for his animated short films, Guard Dog, as well as Your Face. He has done illustrations and cartoons for various publications, including the New York Times, Village Voice, Vogue, Vanity Fair, Rolling Stone, among, amongst others. Uh, he has uh, directed nine feature films, uh, one of which, Slide, just premiered this year at the Big Apple Film, at his New York City premiere at the Big Apple Film Festival. And um, he's also had films screen at other festivals around the country and around mm -hmm. the world. He's had films at the Cannes Film Festival, at Tribeca Film F uh, Festival, Woodstock. Um, I mean, Bill's just had an incredible career, and yeah. he's based right here in New York City. His, yeah. his studios are here in New York. So uh, thank you, Bill, for, for being here. It's my pleasure. It's a lot of fun being at your festival, and uh, I always like talking about animation. Great. So this is uh, exciting for me. Cool. Thank you. And Bill also uh, is uh, going to do some drawings for us as well yeah, today. Yeah, I brought my art pad. Cool. So uh, <laughs> the red light's on. Uh, so yeah. later on, I'll be doing a couple drawing sketches for you. So anybody out there who wants to get into animation, uh, hmm. I will be talking about that too. Perfect. All right. Thank you. So, Bill, yeah, let's talk a little bit about your uh, career. How did mm -hmm. you get started in animation? How did this, how did this all begin for you? Well, I was uh, attracted to animation at a very young age. I think I was three or four years old, and they were started showing Disney films on TV. And uh, they were so funny. It was a goofy, I think it was a goofy film. I started laughing. And my dad, who's a banker, was also a very funny guy. And at parties, he would entertain everybody and have a big crowd of people surrounding him. But I can't do that. I can't tell jokes. I, I can't think of jokes. But I can draw jokes. And so I realized at a very early age that my, uh, my ambition would be to, to draw cartoons to make people laugh. And so I was drawing all the time. I always drew, always took a notebook around with me and uh, write, wrote down ideas, which is very important to write down ideas because sometimes in five minutes they're gone and you'll never find them again. And um, I went to uh, school, uh, high school, and I was a class cartoonist. You know, I did stuff for the newspaper and uh, places like that. And then college, the same thing. I went to Portland State. I'm from Oregon originally, Oregon City, Oregon, which is a suburb of Portland. And uh, for Portland State, I did uh, cartoons for the, the poster, the film committee. I did uh, posters for uh, yearbook. I did uh, artwork for the yearbook. I did artwork for the school newspaper. So I was, that was my thing. I just like, I knew what I wanted. I don't want anything else. I just want to make animation and make people laugh. But unfortunately, when I got out of um, college, uh, this was in the late 60s, or early 70s, animation was a dying art form. Walt Disney had died and the, the studio was in bankruptcy. Uh, and all the other studios, Warner Brothers and Fleischer Brothers, had all gone out of business. So there was no place for me to go except Hanna-Barbera, and I just didn't think Hanna-Barbera was, was animation. I didn't think it was funny either. I, it just wasn't my kind of humor. So I moved to New York, and that's where I started doing all my uh, magazine illustrations and newspaper stuff. Like you said, New York Times. I did New Yorker. A lot of men's magazines. I found a lot of um, uh, sales went to Playboy and Penthouse and Screw and places like that. And so that's where I got the, um, the sort of urge to make animation for adults. Um, I mean, there's plenty of great studios doing animation for kids. I can't compete with them. I don't have that kind of budget. Uh, and I didn't even want to do it anyway. So, you know, it, it just made sense. So um, I, I decided to, to make independent animation uh, for adults, for, for me and for my, my friends. Uh, is this answer too long or you oh, want no, me to shorten no. it? No, it's great. No, yeah, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, but when I moved to New York, I, 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 I couldn't get into animation because all the studios were gone. There was no schools for animation. Um, and so I, I did all the illustration and comic strips. And the good thing about doing these comic strips was um, it was a political strip. I learned two really important things. One is 
to think and draw really quickly. Because mm -hmm. animation, you do hundreds and thousands of drawings, and if you spend too much time on one drawing, you'll never make a film. So I figured out a style, a technique that was really, um, really fast and quick, and then I figured out how to come up with funny ideas real quickly. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that I learned doing uh, comic strips. And then I got my big opportunity in um, 1985. And uh, I was sort of floundering around, I was wishing I could get an animation, but I had no access. So one of my uh, um, clients who I did a, a brochure for said, you know, we have a song from Jules Pfeiffer, the famous Village Voice cartoonist. And we need a, we want to make an animated film out of it. And I heard you want to do animation. I said, yeah, that'd be great. Wow, what a great opportunity. I get make all this money and uh, do animation. And well, and they said, well, there's no money. Uh, we have no money for the budget, but we will show you how to make an animated film. Mm -hmm. And so this was the key to, to me. This was my animation school was making this film. It was called Boomtown. It was about eight minutes long, something like that. And it was a political cartoon, which I was doing anyway on my comic strip, uh, about uh, the nuclear arms race. And um, I think I, I did it in about three months, four months, something like that. I did all the drawings, I did all the coloring, um, but it was really fun because here I was doing an animated film. Mm -hmm. Now I was later in my career, I was like, 38, maybe 37. So I got an animation very late. And, um, but the film went on to a great success. It played at Cannes, it played at uh, Annecy, which is this great French film festival. And it got shown all over the country. It was distributed with a feature film and it was shown all over the place. And so I felt really emboldened to make my own film now, my own story. And so I started doodling, and I uh, actually I can I can I may need more paper because this is. So I'm going to do a drawing of my my main character for your face, the the star of the film, and I wanted to make it really a really boring a boring guy. So he has a little mustache. It's not cartoony at all. His hair is greased back. He's he's sort of like a vacuum cleaner salesman. He's really. It has a tie. I need to look at it. Um, so I needed a guy that really looks very normal and kind of bland, kind of boring. I wanted a boring guy. And he sings this song, uh, and it's a boring song called Your Face. Your face is like a song. <laughs> and it, it's, also, it's very kind of from the 30s. It's very, yeah. very... Um, very uh, boring. And anyway, uh, then I thought, then I could do something weird with his face. How many ways could I distort his face? And so I came up with his nose going all over the place and heads popping out everywhere. And, and it was just an experiment. I just wanted to see how many ways I could distort the face. And um, I think it's about three minutes long, something like that. And um, I sold it to a few places. I think I sold it to um, Spike and Mike and the Tournay of Animation. Um, and I remember the first time I screened it. It was in New York. It was a, a CIFA, which is an animation organization here in New York. And all these big time animators, really, really famous people were in the, in the audience. And they, I showed my film, Your Face. And I was very embarrassed because it's really a, 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 a dumb film. There, there's no... Um, no plot, there's no cut, no editing, no story. He just sings, sings this really bad song. <laughs> and so I was hiding in the back row, like, oh God, they're gonna kick me out of the organization. <laughs> and after about, I don't know, four seconds, five seconds, everybody in the room was, la was laughing. And I gotta tell you that this was amazing to me because all through my career as a, a gag cartoonist and comic strip artist. I never heard people laugh at my artwork before. And to hear a whole room of animators laughing at my drawings was uh, a whole new experience. 
And I, I, I felt like I, I was levitating. I felt like weightless, you know, it was like a, a high, a, like a drug high. And afterwards, uh, they all came up to me and said, are you Bill Plimpton? Did you make that your face film? I said, yeah, that was me. And they said, well, let's go out and have a beer and, and talk animation. And that's the first time I really knew people who were professional animators. And actually, I related to them because they liked my film. And so it started going at all the festivals, like I said, Cannes and, Europe and, and Annecy. And uh, what happened, which was really strange to me, was that uh, distributors would come up to me after the screening and say, well, we like your film a lot. Uh, would you take $5,000 for British territory? Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> and it, it got French and Germany and, and South Korea and all these, all these places I sold the film to. And I really wasn't expecting to make a lot of money on the film. I just thought, you know, this is kind of an amusing film and people might like it. Mm -hmm. And that to me was, was kind of cool. And so I, when I got back from my trip to the festivals, I called all my distributors I'm sorry, all my print uh, clients, all my magazines and newspapers and said, I'm, I'm quitting print, I'm going into animation. And this was 87, uh, 1987. And they said, don't you know animation's dead? Nobody does animation anymore, it's a dead art form. You'll be crawling back to us uh, in a few months, you know, begging, begging to go back to work. I said, no, I think I can, I think I can do it. And this was a time uh, 87 was when animation was starting to to become popular again. You had MTV showing a lot of anime, a lot of really weird animation. You had Little Mermaid and Lion King coming out doing huge, huge box office. And you you had a you worked on a project for MTV at that time, a right? A bunch of projects. You did, okay. Yeah, a bunch of things. And then um, uh, Japanese animation was real hot, and so all of a sudden um, animation was popular again. And I started making making sales, and um, all because of this film, Your Face. And then mm -hmm. I got a call one morning. Um, it's like five in the morning. I was still sleeping, and it's from Canada, and it's Canadian Film Board. And they said, oh, "Congratulations, Bill. Did you know you you got nominated for an Oscar?" I said, "What? I, <laughs> I never entered the Oscars. I don't know even how it got in there." I think it was one of my distributors, uh, Spike and Mike, or the other one, who entered the film, and, and I got in it, which was really nuts, because I was up against uh, two Canadian films. One was a, a, a mega classic called um, The Man Who Planted Trees, and it was, it was epic. I mean, it was 20 minutes long, and it, it was just this beautiful story. And then another one was a, a real commercial uh, cartoon from Canada also, um, Bob and Mary, I think it's called, and and uh, you know my f three minute film done by hand with colored pencil. I mean, it's a stupid film, <laughs> and uh, to get nominated was really uh, a shocker to me. Right. A, a really surprise. But the thing, the weird thing is, this film is amazing legs. I mean, people, even though the song is really bad, and I admit mm. that it's bad. I, I wanted it to be bad. Uh, people s sing it all the time on, on, online, and they create versions of the film using their face, you know, distorting it through the internet, uh, digital digital mm. manipulation and things like that. So it's really uh, kind of iconic. It became, uh, became an iconic film. And mm. when I go to these festivals, people will start singing that, that <laughs> song to me, your face is <laughs> like a song. So I know I can't explain it, but that's wow. how I got my start. Wow, great! Yeah, um, just going back to something you said earlier, um, you had mentioned you had mentioned um, <clears throat> you know that you 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 wanted to tell jokes and do things that were comical. Right. You couldn't necessarily say it, but you were able to draw it, yes. and I just think that's great because you focused on the area that you knew. Uh, you could do. You focused yes. on your strength. You mm -hmm. you focused on what you knew you could do, and not perhaps maybe what you couldn't do so well. Mm -hmm. You focused yeah. on what you were good at, and that yeah. I think that that's that's something that that most people should really be inspired by and pay attention to because that's well, so important to 
focus on what you are. Also, it's what I love to do. And what you love to do, of course. I mean, for me, that was playtime. Right. And I was just playing, and Mm. I'm making money doing doing Mm. these things I love to draw, creating stuff that I I really love to draw. Right. And that's what I do even now. I'm working on more sophisticated films, obviously, than, than this. And it's it's characters that I really love to draw. Right. Yeah. And, that, and really, it's that. You're focusing on what you love to do, and that's yeah. and, and ultimately, you know, that's that, that's that's you know where you're going to find the best results and most success. So uh, you mentioned about independent animation. Yes. Now, having been nominated for Academy Awards mm. uh, and, and receiving all these opportunities from distributors and all this, uh, you know. You, what what do you think is the main reason why you wanted to stay independent? I mean, you have done stuff for the studios. I mean, I know you've done work for The Simpsons yes. and some other shows and the History Channel you've done, right. and things MTV, like that. A lot of MTV a stuff. A lot of MTV stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you certainly have, and you've done some music videos. I know Kanye West, you yeah. did animation for Weird Al Yankovic. Yeah. Uh, so what is it that makes you want to focus uh, on independent animation? Well, you know, in a sense, I, I'm sort of like a painter. I, I really don't work for anybody. I, I create what I want to create, and then I send it out there, and hopefully people will like it, and uh, they'll pay me money to do, uh, to do more. And that's, that's my, my, my plan. Um, you know, I am jealous of the success of The Simpsons. Well, let me tell you a story, hmm. um, if you don't mind. Uh, when I was in Portland, Oregon, and going to Portland State College, uh, they had a film festival called the Portland International Film Festival, and so I um, I went to it because I really was just so crazy for movies now, especially independent films. And there was this guy showing industrials, and if you don't know what industrial is, it's an old uh, uh, sort of film that 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 is a promotion it's a it's a commercial but it's a long commercial it's 20 minutes and he was showing stuff for johnson motors and jansen swimsuits and things like that and they were hilarious they were so it was like monty python doing commercials it was really really great and the guy was there and i went up to him i said wow your films are so funny i I, I really wish I could do something like that. And he said, well, you know, uh, I live real close to here. Why don't you follow me home and well, I'll show you some more of my films. I said, great, that's wonderful. So I uh, followed him up the hill. He lived on the hill in Portland. And I walk in the door and there's this 14 year old kid on the floor drawing cartoons. And I went, oh my God, your cartoons are really funny. You should, you know, you should keep doing it. You really got great cartoons. And it turned out that was Matt Groening. And his father was Homer Groening, which is where he got the name right. Homer. <laughs> and so I've been friends with Matt for a long time. And he would come to this festival in France called Annecy. And uh, we would hang, hang out there. We were out on a, one of these boats, uh, paddle boats, in the middle of the lake, Lake, lake the Annecy. And uh, got drunk on wine and cheese. And, and he says, Bill, you know what? You should do something for The Simpsons. I said, oh, my God, I'd love to work for The Simpsons. That would be great. And uh, so he hired me to do a couch gag, which are these little short uh, bits of animation, 45 seconds long, at the beginning of each episode. So these are really great. And, and you know what? I really respect what, what Matt has done uh, with The Simpsons. He's raised animation to such a high standard that it's it, people can't, not watch it they just have to watch it it's it's such a popular show and i'm very jealous of that i'm very jealous but i think i made the right decision to stay with independent drawing making my own films on by my own and not getting like amazing um uh, you know royalties for showing all over the world and merchandise and and uh, all these episodes that he's done he's done thousands of episodes and I am jealous of that and you know, he's got ads everywhere and the money is no object but for me the, the joy is not the money so much as it is the creation of it and when I can make these films of mine by myself on my own make them however way I want them to me that's that, that makes me happy yeah and there's there's definitely, um, you know, I've heard some filmmakers over the years speak about this, how they prefer 
um, you know, making independent films. They mm. don't want to really have to answer to anybody. Right. They don't want to have to answer. <laughs> and the, sure, the money's great. Yes. But it's like, you know, if I have the opportunity to be in full control of my own project, my own story, I prefer mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Which I think is great and admirable. Yeah. And it's funny because, um, I, you know, I, I really don't understand it so well. But I remember I was at Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con. And a couple of my friends were working at Disney then. And they said, oh, there's a Disney party. You want to go? And I said, oh, you think they'll let me in? <laughs> and they said, yeah, we'll sneak you in. Don't worry. Because, you know, they're pretty strict about their invitations. Everybody wants to go to the Disney party. So this guy snuck me in. And I was walking through uh, this Disney party. I heard over, there's Bill Plimpton. Bill Plimpton's here. And so there's a, there was a reverence. For me, because I, I do work on my own and by myself, and and I don't make tons of money, as you know. But for me, um, I was really shocked that people knew who I was, first of all, and that they they really were big fans of my of my animation. Yeah, what 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 actually uh, inspired you to want to focus on adult animation um, versus more of the you know children? Well, I, the cartoons I did for magazines were mostly all adult, and I found a lot of satisfaction in that. I had a lot of ideas about this. This was a, the swing in the 60s, you know, where uh, there were no rules and taking drugs and, you know, just really um, just indulging yourself. And so I wanted to indulge myself in making ideas uh, in animation that haven't been done before. And that, that's a great thing for me is to, to do new ideas. I mean, this, this thing here, nobody's ever done anything like that before. And it was really, really a shocker that, that it was so, so successful. So if I did kids' cartoons, I wouldn't be into it. I mean, I love kids. I have a child. Uh, but for me, the ex- uh, this is what I think about all day. You know, walking down the streets in New York, you see so many weird things strange surreal things that that's what i want to recreate uh in animation uh it's not necessarily sexual but it's it's just twisted and bizarre and and weird sort of like tim burton that's the kind of humor i i I really i like and that's the kind of humor i'm drawn to yeah i was actually going to ask you you just mentioned tim burton i was going to ask you you know who some of your inspirations were actually that was going to be my next question. well yeah that's a good question definitely uh walt disney uh, just because he showed me, uh, you know, how to make a film and how to how to create a film and how to market a film. Uh, definitely Tex Avery and Bob Clampett, Chuck Jones, because they were doing adult animation, especially Tex Avery. His stuff was really adult, and it was the funniest stuff I'd ever seen. Uh, a guy by the name of Windsor McKay, who did Gertie the Dinosaur way back in the 1910, I think. He was one of the first... A great, great animators. He could draw like amazing. He was. He, I identified with him a lot because uh, he did all his own drawings. I, I myself do all the drawings. I don't hire anybody else to do drawings. He did the backgrounds. I do the backgrounds. His stuff was very surreal, very adult, um, and he was independent. He was doing them on his own, on his free time. Uh, and he was a genius as, as an artist, so he was a big influence. But people like Art Crumb, I think, and, and, and uh, N.C. Wyeth, and um, I mean, there are just so many people that, that influenced me. Mm-hmm. And it's weird because when people see my work on TV, they, they say immediately, oh, that's Bill Plimpton. They know it. But they don't realize that I, I sort of steal from everybody, you know, um, um, Adams Family Guy, Charles Adams, um, R. Crumb, all these people, their, their, their sense of humor, their dark uh, surrealism, mm-hmm. uh, their, their pen and ink style. I, I borrow from everybody. And I, mean, it, I think every artist does that to an extent, right? Every yeah, you're right. Artist, every entrepreneur, every, I think everyone gets ideas from, from other That's you know, true. successful people. That's true. Right? You also mentioned, so in the, you had mentioned Walt Disney. I've always yeah. been fascinated by Walt Disney. Uh, a, of course, as an artist, right, uh-huh. brilliant artist, but you know, also as an entrepreneur, yes. he literally built his own empire, yeah, right. Um, and I just think it's amazing how he was able to to do that. You know, um, he literally built his own world, which yeah. I just think is like incredible. Uh, 
Yeah. Good. Yeah, he was a genius. There's no question about it. In my mind, and maybe I'm, um, you know, influenced by by his success, but in my mind, uh, he was the most uh, brilliant artist ever. Entertainer. Inter I should say entertainer. Um, he he really influenced our culture so much, and he changed so many things. Uh, through his uh, brilliance. Now he wasn't a great art artist, um, and he admits it. But he w he knew how to put the pieces together, how to how to tell a story, how to market a story, um, and and he he really influenced me a lot. And that that's how I did. I I wouldn't uh, work there. Um, it's not my thing. I, I think I would I would probably quit in about a month or two simply because I, I, I don't like drawing cute, cute animals. But um, just the way he, he succeeded and he brought animation to the world. I mean, he, he, showed, he spread his animation everywhere. Uh, and that's, that was amazing. Yeah, 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 and absolutely incredible. Yeah, I'm just, um, I've always just been incredibly fascinated by Walt Disney, no yeah. question about it. Uh, what do you think the key is? Speaking of Walt Disney for another moment, what, what do you think the key of his success is or was? Uh, his storytelling. He really knew how to tell a story. And you probably, well, I don't know if you did know that early in his career, um, he always got bad uh, distribution deals. He couldn't find a good distributor. And they, 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 they saw his films and they said, wow, these are really successful. I'm going to hire all of his artists away and, and make the films on my own and, and you know, distribute them on my own. And uh, Walt got really frustrated because they all thought that it was his artists that were making these films that were so brilliant. But Walt would come up with another idea, another character, Oswald the Rabbit or Mickey Mouse or someone like that, and they would be a, a big success simply because he knew how to um, tell a story. And a lot of the other cartoonists like Fleischer Brothers uh, or some of the early Warner Brothers, they didn't have really good stories. It was just like a bunch of gags. Mm -hmm. But he really knew how to um, connect with the audience. And that's why I think he was so so popular. Right. And uh, in terms of, you know, one of the things you mentioned was distribution. Um, going to now to, to your films, you've mm -hmm. had numerous distributors over the years, like mm -hmm. Stars, I know, had distributed right. um, uh, Hair High. Yeah. And, uh, how, how do you determine which distributor you're going to uh, to go with? <laughs> uh, how does that, how do you? Well, uh, that's, it's pretty much out of my hands. Um, uh, I don't have a lot of offers for my films. Uh, they always get distributed. Um, you know, eventually. But I remember one story. Uh, this was in um, Sundance. I was in Sundance. And I had a film called I Married a Strange Person, which I think is one of my best films. It's really totally outrageous, totally surreal, crazy, crazy film. And so we were at Sundance, and um, we, we got really good reaction from the audience. They applauded and laughed, and they all wanted, you know, they, they all wanted an autograph from me and everything. And so uh, I thought, well, we got it made. This film's going to be a big hit. Nobody bought it. Uh, and I think it's because it was, like I said, it was adult animation, and people didn't think there was an audience. They all thought, oh, it's, it has to be a Walt Disney kind of film. So nobody, nobody bought it. And then I was in this bus. And if you've been to Sundance, they, they have these buses, the shuttle buses. Right, that go the bus around, thing around Park City. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. to ski slopes or to the cinemas. And so I, I was on this one bus, and I saw the guy, the head of Lionsgate Films. I forget his name now, but he's a really nice guy. And uh, so I, I went up to him and said, hey, you remember me? I'm Bill Plimpton. I, I met you at, at some parties. Oh, yeah. Hey, Bill. How you doing? I said, I got a film here. It's called I Married a Strange Person, and you got to see it. It's The audience is loving it, and and I was going to give him a, a disc, and he said, you know, Bill, I got so many films to see. I, they're stacked so high. It's going to take me a year to see all the films. I really can't, can't take your film. Oh, man. I was so pissed. Yeah. And then just then, as I was walking away, the, the shuttle bus doors open and the snowboarder gets on. And he's a you know, 21-year-old kid. He's got the, the, the knit cap with, with snow falling down his face, dripping everywhere. And he had his 
this keyboard there and a snowboard rather and it was dripping snow on our shoes and everything and and so he says you're bill plimpton you made i'm a disgrace person F that film rock dude that was the greatest film i've ever seen congratulations <laughs> bill plimpton wow and then he jumps off the bus and goes on down the hill uh-huh and he's gone uh. and that was it <laughs> and so this guy from lionsgate says God, I guess I better see your film. <laughs> so I, I handed him the disc, and uh, he bought it. Oh, wow. For a lot of money. And not only that, but one of the rarest things I've ever seen is I got a, a royalty check for a, mm. a substantial amount of money. Just because this crazy yeah. dude, <laughs> snowboarder. Wow, that snowboarder should it. get some commission from I know. That. I wish <laughs> I could find him and track the guy down and give him some money. Anyway, uh, so that explains how I get my distribution. <laughs> wow. There's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just a matter of luck sometimes. Right. What do you think about filmmakers who are self-distributing? Do you think that's Well, a I've option? done that. I've mm -hmm. done that. So I've had a few films that are a little weird, a little uh, uh, twisted. And so I distribute it myself. I will uh, I hire a guy to uh, book the films, and they get booked into a lot of theaters all over. They're they're very popular. But do you always do a theatrical release when you self distribute yes. your films? You do. Yeah, yeah. I like to get a theatrical. Now it's not as important as it used to be with uh, Netflix and people like that. But to get nominated for an Oscar, you have to have a theatrical release. So it's it's important to me. Yeah. So I think about half of my films, maybe five of them, I've I self-distributed and you know I make money uh, and I don't lose money which if sometimes I do a dis distribution deal uh, they'll say sorry we didn't um, make much money so we're keeping all the money and I, 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 I get nothing and that's very frustrating because I know people like the film which is it's hard to find my audience that's yeah. th that's the problem so uh, I'm hoping with this new film slide I'll be able to do it Right. So is that the time there? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I better do another drawing real quick. Oh, sure. Um, I'm going to do the dog. Or should I do slide? What do you think? Um, either one. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do the slide then. All right. Now, this is a film that was influenced by my uh, growing up in Oregon. Mm -hmm. It's in the woods. We had a lot of lo uh, logging camps there. So uh, this is the, uh, the guy. He's kind of mystical cowboy who works, uh, goes to a lumber camp. And uh, it's a corrupt, very corrupt town. And he, but he plays guitar. And because of his music, he's able to get rid of the, the corruption uh, in the town. It's hard to draw at an angle like this. He's a cowboy, but he doesn't have guns. But the cool thing about the film is that there's a lot of a lot of bad guys. There's probably 200 bad guys. There's probably more bad guys in this film than any other film that I've ever I've ever done. And to me, that that's the fun part is is uh, drawing bad guys. I love I love to draw bad guys. It's just, yeah, villains are sometimes the most interesting part yeah, of the film, I mean, depending on what the film is. But you are correct. <laughs> Something like that. It's Very called cool. Slide. Yeah, it's awesome. New York City premiere at the Big Apple Film Festival. That's right. Very cool. Slide. I better Thanks. sign it for you here. Very cool. Uh, Thank you. So anyway, this film uh, took a lot longer than my other film simply because um, COVID. Uh, I started it in 2017, I think, something like that maybe 2018, and then that's just when COVID hit. And COVID killed a lot of my markets. A lot of my cinemas shut down, schools shut down, comic conventions shut down. And that's where I make a lot of my, my, my money. That's where I make a lot of my income. So I had to stop working on slide and, and take commercial jobs. That's where I did some uh, Weird Al music videos and the Kanye West and, and some other things. I did some commercials. Um, I did some documentary, animation for documentaries. So this way I was able to continue making money and supporting my studio. But um, 
the film took about seven years, and that's rare for me. Usually the film takes about uh, three, three years to make. Mm -hmm. But because of COVID, I, I really had to um, stop working on it. Right, right. And I know, I believe it has, the world premiere was at Woodstock, right? Yes. And we had the New York City premiere. Yeah, you're right. Uh, so where is it landing next? Do you have festivals lined up, distribution? Yeah, there's a lot of festivals coming in. We, we've got three distributors who are hot on it. Uh, my agent is uh, negotiating with them now. Uh, we, may, we may have a screening, um, a week-long screening at the um, uh, IFC Cinema. On, can, down in the Village. Yeah, the 7th Village. Avenue. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. 4th Street. And because they love animation, they, they're big fans of my work, and this way it'll qualify for the Oscar. Right. Plus, I have a new short, too, called uh, Duckville. And so we're going to put the short with the feature and hopefully qualify two films. Never been done before. No one's ever qualified a short film and a feature film the same year. That's our Cool. So our IFC plan. Center would do a Bill Plimpton yep. uh Week or week, whatever it yeah, might be, yeah. A week, yeah. And then after we negotiate a deal, then we'll come out more, you know, more more uh, lengthy showings. Right now, for the theatrical runs, I understand the Oscar nomination. You know, is that's you have to have a theatrical run in order to yeah. to, to be uh, eligible for the Oscars. Um, but in addition to that, do you feel that the Oscar? Uh, excuse me, sorry. Do you feel that the theatrical run is essential for? Uh, for films to kind of stand out a bit too because there's so much on the streaming platforms yeah, now? Not, not for me. Uh, I, I, um, I just don't have the name like Tim Burton uh, or Matt Groening to open up wide in cinemas. My, my audience is uh, kind of specific. It's, it's uh, college kids and older uh, who like something very different, very weird, very offbeat, very sexual usually and so i don't think i could uh I, I definitely need a big theatrical release uh if i can make a sale to netflix or hulu or someone like that that would be enough money for me to show a profit because my budgets are very low uh for anybody out there who's uh wants to be an animator i have what's called plimpton's dogma get a pencil out you want to write this down plimpton's dogma these are my three rules to be a success in animation. Rule number one, make your film short. Whether it's a short film, make it three, uh, five minutes or less. All my films, the dog films, are about five minutes. Number two, make it cheap. Keep it under $1,000 a minute. So a five minute film is about $5,000. If you use a lot of Maya and computers, and you gotta hire a lot of computer operators, it's gonna really blow out the budget and it's gonna be impossible to, uh, to make your money back. And number three, make it funny. If you make a funny film, everybody's going to want to buy it. It's, that's, I don't know why that is. People see animation, they expect to laugh. So those three things, short, cheap, and funny, if you can follow those rules, your film will be a success. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned, too, was, you know, you have a very specific audience, mm -hmm. uh, you know, unlike, let's say, Tim Burton it's a, gets these wide releases. Right. But I, I think for, for emerging filmmakers, young filmmakers just coming up now, I actually think that's a really great lesson. You really should have a very specific, targeted audience. Mm -hmm. Because I think when you try to, to, to you know, hit the mainstream, it right. becomes much more difficult. Like, that's yes. very challenging. But if you start just mm -hmm. with, a, with a very specific, you know, audience, that's great. And not even yeah. just to start, that could be your career, like you've done and you've yeah. proven. Yeah, you yeah. have your audience, and that's No, fantastic. I do have an audience, and they're very, very true. They, whenever I do a Kickstarter campaign, I, I usually get, do very well because people say, oh, Bill Plimpton's got a new film. Let's, let's give him some money. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, being independent is up and down, um, and right now it's down because I, I really worked hard on Slide, Mm -hmm. uh, I really wanted this film to be my my epic, and so I, I went into debt because of that, and because uh, it wasn't finished in time. So, uh, but I'm making the money back now, fortunately, yeah. and when it comes out in theaters, hopefully I'll, I'll I'll make my money back. And so, you know, Walt Disney did the same thing when he did Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. He was a million dollars in debt, and back then, you know, in 1920 or 39, 38. A uh, million dollars is a lot of money, and so you got to gamble. You got to believe in yourself. You got to believe in what you're doing. You got to believe that this is gonna, 
you know, win a, a Nobel Prize or mm -hmm. be epic. You're going to be really, really popular. And that's what that's what I do. I believe that each film I make is is the best film I, I could make, and and uh, that's 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 how you succeed. Yeah, no, it's great. You make it for you. You have a dedicated audience. You've mm -hmm. built your own brand. You right. have uh, you know you have a fan base, and yes. you know you've had them with you for years, and that's uh -huh. uh, commendable. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, and I know we're not going to, we can't, we're not going to really spend a lot of time on this. Uh -huh. and there's not much to, to say about it at this point, but AI mm -hmm. um, obviously uh, has become a big part of this industry, mm -hmm. just like anything else. Whenever technology uh, uh, comes into play, we have positive things that come from it and negative things like yeah. anything, right? The automobile comes along. Great. You get places quicker, right. but then you have other issues. Social media comes along. Great. You know, there's a lot of great things about social media, but it's also created issues. Now, I would say the same thing's happening with AI. Um, do you have any thoughts on 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 that? Not, not really. I'm not a computer guy. Uh, I, uh, I I like hand drawn. For me, that's that's really cool. Uh, I've seen some AI films. I like them. They're they're interesting. They're very bizarre and strange. Um, and I found out that a lot of people are copying my style on AI. And so I was contacted by a, a lawyer and they're putting together a lawsuit against AI. I don't know what, what they can do, but uh, with all the big names in animation like Tim Burton and Matt Groening and people like that uh, to, to sue AI. Uh, but I, I don't know, they just sent me a letter and that's, that's all I know about it. You know, it's it's hard for me to decide because I really don't don't understand it very well, and I, it's not I don't have the time to understand it. <laughs> I'm too busy making my films, but we'll see what it happens in a few more years. Yeah, well, aside from AI, what do you see the future like right now for the animation industry, both in Hollywood and and in? Well, I tell you what's really exciting for me, and someone should do a book. If there's anybody out there who's a writer, uh, do a book about this is the whole rise of the indie animated feature. And I, I must admit, I think I may have had a little uh, influence on that, because when I did this film called The Tune, and this was my first animated feature, this was in uh, 1991, I believe, uh, nobody was doing independent animated feature films. Um, and I think I proved that one person could make an animated feature film by themselves. Uh, because I did every drawing in the tune, all the backgrounds, all the coloring, all the details. I didn't do the music or the voices, but I did all the, the picture. And now everyone's doing it, and I love it. I mean, they're sitting at home on their laptop making an animated feature film, and that's, you're getting some great, great ideas, great concepts, great, great visuals, and that, that's the future. Soon, you don't need to be in a big studio. You just need to uh, uh, make your own film and distribute it and get it out there, put it online and, and uh, make, hopefully make some money. Yeah, well, I was having some conversation with filmmakers during the COVID shutdowns mm -hmm. about what's gonna happen now. Uh -huh. uh, and some of them felt that uh, animation uh, was going to blow up at that point because yeah. you could just work from home. That's that right. and archival footage-based documentaries. I know. We were, thought <laughs> would good. be really what was going to happen. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, a good concept. The, the so. Documentaries are um, there's yeah. so much. Um, and Mickey Mouse got public domain too. Yes, I heard so about that. But can, only the original, the, the very, one. very original one. Yeah. So if yeah. you use, if, if you can use Mickey Mouse, but it has to be based on the one from nineteen twenty four. Four, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, so, how do you think? I'm just glad you brought that up. How do you think that's going? Is, do you think that's going to change anything now? Do you think? Yeah. Well, in fact, gonna... I did a film um, called Hitler's Folly. Did you ever see that film? I've not. No. It's online. You can see it online, and it's 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 kind of a dark dark humor film. It's about Hitler, who was misunderstood. He really wanted to be an artist, as you know, but he wanted to make animation. And so we found some of his animated, uh, Walt, uh, Hitler's animated short films. And they're really cute, they're very nice. And he was trying to build, make this epic, um, uh, epic German feature film animation. So he wanted to follow Disney, he wanted to be like the Disney of Germany. And so we have a bunch of 
uh, uh, photographs of him, you know, drawing these cartoons and stuff like that. It's very twisted, very twisted <laughs> film. But I've, I've, I've done nine animated features. I'm working on my 10th now. But I've also done some live action, and the Hitler's Folly is one live action, and then I did Guns of the Clackless, which I think is a really good, it's a mockumentary, it's like Spinal Tap. Right. It's a really good film. Uh, then I did a couple of other documentaries that are more serious. So I've, I think I've done in all maybe 14 feature films. Wow, and then there's actually a documentary about you called Adventures of yeah, the Pumtoons. Pumtoons, yeah. Yes. yeah. That was a while ago. It's nice, but it's mostly for historical context. There, um, I had some um, conflicts with it. Uh, the, the director was very nice, very sweet. She did a good job, but I would have done it differently. And so, I mean, I can recommend it if you want a historical thing, but, um, I, you know, I wish you'd done a better job. Okay. Uh, now, you uh, currently, I know Slide is, is out right now, and you're mm. going to the theatrical run and all that, right. IFC Center, and, uh, um, you know, looking forward to that. I mean, mm. uh, that's going to be really exciting. That uh, will do, be, yeah. Do you uh, have any other projects in pre-production right now or are you just focusing on slide right yes now? let's see I, i'm gonna have to turn one of these pages over because i am doing one right now that's really exciting it's called uh, yeah i can work on the back of the paper here it's called duckville it's a short film oh duckville and this is the one you mentioned might go along with yeah uh slide at the ic slide, center yeah mm -hmm. it's very simple uh the duck like that it's a very uh, basic kind of character. That's it. That's it. Just yeah. that's Duckville, and it's about this little village uh, of ducks um, called Duckville, of course, where um, they want to uh, get tourists. They're, nobody wants to go there because it's so boring. It's Duckville is very boring. Nobody wants to go there, so they just they invent a um, a, a a mass uh, stampede of monsters monsters come in and ruin the town and that way the king will come and and fix up their town and we'll get they'll get tourists it's very simple it's about six minutes long we're we're really close to being done probably about two or three weeks it should be done and then we're going to start showing that and maybe we'll send it to the big apple if yeah if you like it great it's, yeah that, yeah it's pretty wacky uh i don't want to give away any more than that that's all enough. right are you going to be releasing Slide and hopefully Duck in uh, L.A. as well? Absolutely, doing, yeah. No, we think that's a big, a big market, and there's a um, um, a bunch of great festivals out there too. We want to we want to show it too. Yeah, and now, do you um, uh, when you cast, do you uh, have specific actors in mind when you're developing a project, or does that come later? Well, quite frankly, I, I've done a film, Hair High, actually, Hair that High. was SAG. And so we had a lot of big names, David Carradine, Keith Carradine, Martha Plimpton. Right. Um, um, I read that Martha Plimpton is related. Related yeah. to you. It's a distant, right. it's a distant one. <laughs> uh, and it was very expensive. I had a lot of money then. I had done a big commercial or something. And uh, it didn't do very well. So I, I, I realized that the, the, the actors, even though they're, they're big names, it didn't really help that much for for me anyway so now i do use uh, non-sag actors mm -hmm. and i have these are people who are amateurs um and but they're really good they really uh, have great voices and so i i just can't afford sag it's just yeah. you know the deal with sag i don't want to get into politics too much here but the deal with sag is that they're uh, you have to pay a lot of money to use a sag actor which I understand, you know, for big Hollywood films, yeah, they should get paid a lot. But I'm I'm an independent uh, film with, with no money, and they said, sorry, it doesn't matter. You're an animated film; you got to pay full SAG prices. And um, so I, I I I just couldn't do it. And the the weird thing is, for live action indie films, you get a discount. You don't have to pay all that money. But for animated indie films, you got to pay. They think everybody is Pixar and everybody's Disney, mm -hmm. so we got to pay the full full fee. And I just it breaks my budget. I can't I can't do it. Well, that, that's interesting because it, I wasn't. That's actually something I was going to ask you. 
because when you're when you're SAG, it's you're not like okay, so you're not on the screen though. It's only your voice, right? It's just but it's voice. the Screen Actors Guild, and the and the whole oh, point is right. that you're appearing yeah. on screen. But yet, in an animated, it's just your voice. But you still have to go through SAG yeah. if you were using SAG talent for that. That's it. Yeah, we tried to change the rules. A couple of my guys, Matthew Modine, who does a lot of. Um, animation voices. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, we actually had Matthew also in the I know. in the festival as yeah, well last yeah. year. Was it Downwind? Um, no, it was his. Uh, it was the, the uh, short experimental film. Oh um, right, right. I yeah. heard about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so he wanted to change the rules because it's not fair that indie live action gets a discount, whereas indie animation now you got to pay full price. So he tried to change it, but they they wouldn't change. Wow. They didn't want to change. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting. You're yeah. not on screen, but yet at the same time, you have to go through SAG. Yeah. Wow. So uh, in terms of your uh, – you're talking about the, the budgeting and all that. Uh, for filmmakers who are looking to finance their feature film or even a short, mm -hmm. um, how, what are some of the best routes to take? How do you, I know you mentioned Kickstarter was one. Do you have other yeah. – Well, private investors? generally speaking, uh, my, my, my feature films um, keep bringing money in because they – you know, they, they go out to schools and libraries and foreign countries, and they, they're always selling. They're always making money. Mm -hmm. So I use the money from the previous films to finance my future films. Okay. Also, now I've discovered that I have a huge market in my original artwork. And I, I have a lot of drawings. <laughs> mm -hmm. I even have the Simpsons drawings. And um, I got my whole wall is bins of, of drawings from different films. And I find that there are a lot of collectors out there who love to collect original art. So that's been a real boon. Uh, just in the last two or three years, we've been selling a lot of the original artwork. It's something like Your Face, uh, my first film, is uh, we charge 300 bucks for a, a drawing. So And I have hundreds of drawings, so it, it works out very well for me. Yeah. So that's another source of income. Um, I try not to rely on Kickstarter. I, I've been using them so much. I think people are getting tired of me pitching my films. So I, I'm hoping to, um, uh, to, to use the money from my previous films to finance my next one. Yeah, that's good. You mentioned some other outlets um, in order to um, bring in revenue uh, mm -hmm. when distributing films that I think some filmmakers may not always think of. You mentioned the educational market yep. uh, was one way, yeah. um, and a couple. Was the, I think there was one other you mentioned as well. It was educational and uh, I don't know some foreign countries, uh, for, you know, foreign territories. You know, but but also I, I a lot of merch. Merch. I have books. Yeah. I have DVDs. I have um, uh, clothes shirts and things like that uh so yeah I, I get a lot of money from that too yeah it's, that's important i think when putting a film out to have various revenue streams boy it sure you is know, yeah i think that's that's super important disney yeah. showed you how to do that boy they those disney those mickey mouse watches they made millions on that and Bulova was going i heard it was going out of business they were really bankrupt and they came up with this mickey mouse watch and it saved their company Wow, this is what I heard. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Um, for for uh, for filmmakers who are looking to go to school for animation, do you have any specific schools, perhaps, that you'd recommend? Well, SVA is good. SVA has a really good program. They're here in New York, School of Visual Arts, mm -hmm. Cal Arts, uh, but Cal Arts is really expensive. Uh, they're a, a Disney-supported school, and they're all the big uh, Pixar people came from there. They all they all went went to Cal Arts. Um, uh, there's um, some in Florida, some really good ones, uh, and New York, NYU is really good here. RISD is good. Um, uh, what's the name of the Florida one? There's a couple of good Florida festivals. Ringling, Ringling uh, has really good art and animation mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. um, full Sail, Full Sail. Oh, Full oh, Sail. That's in California. Yeah, no, that's Florida. Oh, Florida, Florida. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they do really good stuff. Yeah, I believe, yeah, they also, you know, just in terms of just you know live action too. I think they have a, a they film. Have a few, a they film even school. have a back lot. Right. I, I, I was down there a few months ago, and they have this back lot, this old city, fake a fake city that you can <laughs> shoot your film in, and I was really impressed that the schools have a back lot. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you, um, we just have a couple minutes left. There's a sure. couple more questions. Uh, uh, you've done some political satire. Yes. Uh, for example, I know you have Trump bites uh, with the New York Times yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, 
Do you have? Uh, is that something you want to continue on with political satire? Do you no, enjoy I don't. That? I or don't. You... I, I'm, I'm tired of drawing Trump. Uh, as much as I, 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 I hate the guy, I, I just want to concentrate on my own uh, storytelling mm -hmm. and my own ideas. Oh, so that was was that something the New York Times brought you on for? That yes. wasn't. Oh, that wasn't an independent thing that you sold to them. They no, no, brought you no, on no. to do that. I okay. did a series of them. I think I did six six episodes. Right, and they were really hot. They were the number one seller are on the New York Times uh, um, online mm -hmm. uh, programming. So that was it's really popular. But I, I just wanted to go back to making my feature films. Right now, you and and lastly. You, I know you're from Oregon. Yeah, uh, and obviously, LA seems to be the hot spot for a lot of right. people who want to get into sure film. Does. Of course, New York is also. Tons of people go to LA. Yeah. Why did you choose New York City? Uh, well, because animation was dead when I got out of college, and so and there was no schools. Uh, there was no Cal Arts back then. There's no place to learn animation, so I figured I might as well go into illustration. And that's when I moved to New York and took my portfolio around and got a lot of work with magazines. And uh, when I did animation, then I, <clears throat> I, um, I just wanted to make it on my own. But I do have a story to tell uh, on this on this uh, issue, mm -hmm. if if you like. Yeah. Um, so I, I remember when I was 12, I, I sent off a packet of drawings to Walt Disney Studios because I, I wanted to work for them when I grew up. And uh, they liked the drawings. You know, I did Goofy and Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And they liked the drawings. And they said, you know, come back in 20 years and we'll see. <laughs> so I said, wow, yay, they, they're, they're ready to offer me a job. <laughs> and um, then I started doing my own films, you know, The Tune and I Married a Strange Person and stuff like that. Uh, but then when um, Your Face was nominated for an Oscar, uh, they sent a lawyer to my studio here in New York. And he looks me in the eye and he says, Mr. Plimpton, Walt Disney Studios wants to offer you a million dollars to come work for us. Wow, that's I a got, great offer. Holy cow, a million? And this was back in 87, so that, that was a lot of money. And I was so excited, I, I told him, I said, this is my childhood dream come true. This is, this is what I wanted. And I said, but you know what? I love doing these little short films. Can I do those on the weekend? They said, yeah, you can do them, but Disney will own them. And I said, well, what happens if I tell a funny story? Well, D Disney owns that. And what happens if I, I have a dream? Well, that's Disney's. Disney owns your dream. And I thought of a while and I said, you know, I don't know if this is right for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I imagine that after about a month or two working out there, I'd probably start doing little fanciful, surreal stuff in the drawings and hiding characters in there and maybe doing some naughty artwork or something like that. I just don't think that at that time in my, my life I was ready to work for Disney. I just, I don't think I would have been excited working there, um, doing, you know, funny animals and things like that. I only found out later that they wanted me for Aladdin to do the genie, you know, where the genie is shape, changing shapes and everything. And because that, the, the metamorphosis of this guy from your face is what, what they were looking for, something really surreal. Um, right. So I turned him down. Well, that I, goes back to what you said earlier about, you know, being independent, staying true to your, your own work, uh, and having to feel passionate about what you're doing every day. Right. And it can't just be about the money they're offering or what it has to be something you're into and you're passionate about. Right, right. And what I tell people is every morning when I get up, I go to my drawing board and draw whatever the hell I want. And there's no one looking over my shoulder saying, no, nah, no, you can't draw that. And to me, that's worth more than a million bucks. Oh, definitely. That's, that's the best why feeling. I, I'm independent. No, that's great. I mean, that's a great feeling to know you wake up in the morning. This is my thing. I'm doing yeah, it my way. Right. I don't have to answer to anybody. Right. That's better than working for Disney. I that's think right. um, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And lastly, do you, you you're you are um, you mentioned you're inspired by the people of New York walking around New York City right, and all right, that. Right. Um, what is it about this city that 
inspires you? I mean, I know it inspires me in so many uh, ways and a lot of other artists, but yeah. uh, what inspires you about New York City? Well, the, the freedom of everybody um, d just doing whatever they want and walking on the streets um, totally um, unselfconscious. You know, they'll, they'll wear something really bizarre or crazy or nothing at all, you know. And I, I find that every block I come up with two or three ideas. And so for me, that's, that's, uh, that's really important. If you walk in the streets in L.A., it's, you see nothing. I mean, there's nobody on the sidewalk. <laughs> right. But here in New York, it's just all, they all let it all hang out. And that's, that's inspirational for me. No doubt about it. I agree. All right. Well, thank you so much you for bet. being here. Um, again, this is Bill Plimpton. His new film, Slide, which yes. had its New York City premiere at the Big Apple Film Festival, is coming out. Uh, yes. We'll see it in theater soon. Okay. So, Bill, thank you so much for being here. And um, we'll see you all soon. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very good. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.